50 years ago, psychedelics like LSD were considered cutting edge science. But this powerful drug escaped the lab and became a street drug with a dangerous reputation, inspiring perceived moments of genius. I took a trip through architectural history. Or descents into madness. Now, science is taking a fresh look at LSD, including the first experiments on humans in 30 years. To separate the myth from the molecule, Explorer puts LSD under the microscope. These treats are going into a care package unlike any most people have ever received. I have a friend that really, really enjoys different uh, types of gummy candies. I try to send them something fun based on their personal interests. This woman is a drug dealer. We'll call her Alice. She's dosing these candies with LSD. I love psychedelics. I love connecting with people with psychedelics. A cap full of this batch, odorless and colorless, contains enough doses for 200 customers. LSD is one of those things you just want everyone to eat it. Two drops is all it takes. For the price of a movie ticket, one of these treats can take you on a 12-hour psychedelic trip. Dosed, counted, and wrapped, her psychedelic sweets are ready for delivery. If what I'm providing them is really good, something they're getting excited about, it makes me really excited and happy. This psychedelic drug known since the 1960s as Acid, Dots, L, Zen, Tabs, Purple Haze, White Lightning, and Electric Kool-Aid isn't just for hippies anymore. Hello? What's up? According to a US study, its most likely users are educated white males ages 18 to 22. Twenty-three million people in the United States have taken it. And more than 600,000 will try LSD every year. But using and selling the drug is a felony. If Alice is caught, she could be fined $2 million and sentenced up to 40 years in prison. Why are so many people willing to break the law for this illicit drug? Within 20 to 30 minutes, you begin to feel energy flowing through your skin. You begin to smell the music. Ecstasy and fun and laughter and deeper vision and compassion. A collapse of time and space. You can see much more connectedness between everything. What looks like a duality, which is the rug versus the wall, is really a continuum of rug wall. And rug wall ceiling, and rug wall ceiling people, and rug wall ceiling people, fruit, music. You know, flash that experience of, of, of the other, of, of the divine. It's opening your eyes onto a vast horizon that you had no idea ever even existed. I think LSD would have to be considered to be one of the most powerful substances in the world. LSD's physical effects are minimal. Dilated pupils, a rise in body temperature, heart rate, and blood pressure. But its effect on the mind is another story. 
A trip could take the user to heaven or to hell. Those who take LSD are putting themselves at the mercy of illegal labs and chemists. But some are willing to take that risk, including committing a felony for what they claim is the drug's therapeutic potential. This therapist, deep in the woods of California, is doing just that. He's asked us to hide his identity to protect him from prosecution. I'm not selling anything. I'm not dealing anything. All I'm doing is give people a dose of a medicine so they can do their own exploration. Uh, that's basically the risk I'm taking. His patient today is a 58-year-old woman we'll call Denise. She's at the peak of a $300 psychedelic therapy session. 40 minutes ago, she ingested a large dose of very pure and very illegal LSD. Denise hopes this psychedelic session will help her overcome obstacles in her relationships and creativity. I know that I'm a very creative and artistic person, and I just can't quite do it. And I think it has to do with um, uh, events that have happened to me in the past, uh, damage that I've taken on. It makes the invisible visible. Feelings that you haven't felt before are felt. Memories that you had no idea were there suddenly come back. The whole universe is inside of you. Like a microscope, psychedelics seem to amplify the unconscious mind, revealing the unseen. I feel that I have been to the outer reaches of the death experience and come back. Mm -hmm. And it's filled with beauty, filled with wonders, small wonders. Since its beginning, scientists have been searching for a way to harness this power. Think of the things that change a person's life. You fall in love, you get married, you have kids, a parent or sibling dies get a divorce, you take LSD. And for some people, they never see the world again exactly the same way. Why can a molecule do that? Dr. David Nichols, professor of pharmacology at Purdue University, is one of a select number of scientists in the world with permission to experiment with lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD. He also has a license to make it. Well, I think we make the world's purest LSD. Since the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, these ingredients are restricted or illegal. But Nichols and his team have the Drug Enforcement Agency's approval to make about a thousand doses per year. The LSD comes off as a, as a fluorescent band at the edge of this plate. We collect it into tubes and concentrate it down and crystallize it so we can get very pure material that way. This pure LSD has helped Nichols study the effects of its molecular structure in the brain. We think that it activates a type of brain receptor that's known as a serotonin 2A receptor. That receptor is actually located on cells in the frontal cortex and is involved in the computations that, that help us to visualize and interpret the reality around us. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter responsible for relaying signals between brain and nerve cells. Perception, emotion, appetite, and sleep are all affected by its fluctuations. 
LSD's chemical structure is similar to serotonin and fits almost like a key into the serotonin receptors, stimulating their activity subtly or profoundly. <sighs> Serotonin may play a role in the extreme pain that this man is experiencing. LSD may play a role in relieving it. His name is Chuck, and he's suffering from a cluster headache. Pain is described like having an ice pick go through your eye or jabbing into your head somewhere that people will bang their heads against the wall, against oxygen tanks, against the floor, pulling their hair out to distract themselves from the pain of this headache. Scientists don't fully understand what causes cluster headaches, but believe abnormalities in blood vessels, nerves, and brain chemicals play a part. There is no cure, and few treatments that provide relief. Oxygen may shorten the attack by constricting blood vessels, but it's taking two and a half canisters for this one to subside. It can ruin your life, it can destroy your work. Myself and virtually every other sufferer wants to be left alone. But some sufferers have found illicit relief in psychedelic drugs like LSD and psilocybin the psychoactive component in magic mushrooms. One patient, she had... Uh, a survey by Harvard Medical School psychiatrist John Halpern reported that for 53 sufferers, psychedelics prevented or stopped cluster headaches more reliably than prescription drugs. But they're illegal. And for Chuck, that makes them off limits. I made a promise to my two girls that I would never take an illegal drug. I don't make promises lightly, and that's a commitment that I made to them. And so we found out it works. Yeah. So this is not that we suggest... Halpern and his colleagues at Hanover Medical School in Germany launched a trial treating six cluster headache sufferers with a non-psychedelic form of LSD called bromo. It is not hallucinogenic. The, this bromo side uh, atom is so big that it doesn't sit in the receptor in the brain that would trigger the normal intoxication. The drug was administered to each patient three times over a 15-day period. For five of the six patients, the headaches were gone, with no psychedelic effects. Martin Cruz is one of the lucky patients. Since this treatment, I have no pain. I can work, I can do sports. All the patients, they told me that the quality of their life um, had changed totally. They could not believe that the headache had stopped. <laughs> Okay. At the moment, no further studies have been funded to administer LSD, psilocybin, or even non-hallucinogenic bromo to any other patients. For now, sufferers like Chuck will have to rely on their oxygen tanks. It's a long road because we're not going to get federal support for researching the therapeutic use of a drug that's labeled just a drug of abuse that harms. At least not yet. With good data, that might change. When you can remove the hallucinogenic properties of it, we might be able to get it legalized for prescription use. And if it can get rid of these things, oh, that, would, that would be such a lifesaver. It's not a cure. We realize it's not a cure. It's a Band-Aid, but it's a big Band-Aid. Exactly how the LSD molecule works to relieve cluster pain is a mystery for scientists. Even LSD's creator, 
was perplexed by its overall effects when he stumbled upon them by accident. 1938, chemist Albert Hoffman, working for the Swiss pharmaceutical company Sandoz Laboratories, seeks a respiratory stimulant. He turns to a molecule known to constrict blood vessels, ergot, a fungus that grows on wild grass. Then he synthesizes an ergot derivative called lysergic acid with diethylamide. While experimenting with the compound five years later, a tiny speck drops onto his skin and enters his bloodstream. Within 40 minutes, he feels its effects. Intrigued, he takes a larger dose. And on his bike ride home, Hoffman experiences the world's first LSD trip. He knew immediately that this was big. It had a profoundly powerful effect on his consciousness, on his mental activity, on his feelings, his thoughts, his perceptions, his awareness. This drug is potent, 25 micrograms, less than the weight of two salt grains can be enough to feel the effects. One ounce of LSD is enough to dose 300,000 people. At the same time, on the other side of the world, scientists were exploring the physics of the atom. Could Hoffman's molecule have the same explosive power but within the brain. This was a pivotal event because back in the 1940s, people were not thinking about the brain and behavior as a neurochemical, biochemical system. Sandoz Laboratories felt LSD had potential. Within months, these ampules with the trade name Delicid were arriving at the doorsteps of scientists and psychiatrists around the world free of charge. By 1965, more than 2,000 LSD articles were published in medical journals and 40,000 patients given delicid. Its effects were tested on everything from alcoholism to autism. Even the CIA and the military got in on the action dosing their own operatives to see if LSD could be used as the ultimate covert weapon, mind control. The drug was administered in a drink of water. These the dosed police. British soldiers were anything but controllable. One hour and 10 minutes after taking the drug, with one man climbing a tree to feed the birds, the troop commander gave up. Its effects, however, were undeniable and the psychiatric community began using a new word, meaning mind manifesting. Psychedelic. In Menlo Park, California, another group of scientists set out to see what else LSD could do. It was just one of many legal human experiments around the country. James Fadiman was a Stanford graduate student at the time. I'm James Fadiman. One of the questions was, could psychedelics be used for non-mystical problem solving, for scientific, hard-nosed, data-rich stuff? And the answer that we had at the time was nobody had any idea. Well, gentlemen, here's mud in your eyes. Cheers. So we took senior scientists and said to them, we will give you a psychedelic session, and the price of admission is a problem that you have been working on for at least three months and are frustrated about and that matters to you a lot. Their problems ranged from abstract scientific equations to practical architecture and furniture designs. 
We gave them a psychedelic, we gave them some hours to just relax and be with themselves, and then we got them up and said, it's time to work on your problems, and they dove in. I took a trip through architectural history and visited and saw various cities and places. Each subject claimed that with focus and guidance, LSD allowed them to approach their problem with a fresh perspective or instilled them with the freedom to explore ideas more openly. The result? Patents issued, products built, theories extended and improved, papers published, and more importantly, for many weeks thereafter, according to the scientists, their overall level of creativity was up. All is love, sweet and tender, unbridled by the social inhibition... Word got out about the power of LSD and its psychedelic cousins, psilocybin and mescaline. The time was ripe for exploration. Children raised in the staid 1950s were rejecting the status quo. Protests over the Vietnam War and the fight for civil rights fueled a re-examination of government and social mores. Led by charismatic leaders like Ken Kesey, poet Allen Ginsberg, it does mean some LSD there as a useful social catalyst. Useful and Harvard psychologist Timothy Leary. Turn on. Tune in. Run out. Hundreds of thousands turned on around the world. But then things started going wrong. Dig everybody. L. S.D. Bad trips and a chance of chromosome damage. Four little Indians on LSD. One freaked out, then there were three. Claims surfaced that LSD caused madness, birth defects, and suicide, and could even drive people to commit murder. In 1965, the U.S. government began shutting down scientific studies across the country. Fadiman's was one of them. The middle of our seventh session, around really literally noon, a uh, certified letter arrived from the federal government. We opened it and it said, as of the moment of reading this letter, your research is terminated. The research is over. And I held this letter and I looked around the room, knowing that in the other room we had four scientists in the midst of a psychedelic session with major problems on their minds. And I said to the group, I think we got this letter tomorrow. Within five years, the U.S. government classified it as a Schedule I drug, declaring it had no medical value. Research hit a brick wall and stopped. And so that was the last research for about 40 years. By the late 1960s, LSD shed its lab coat and moved onto the street, where it's never left. Today, researchers are back in the lab with psychedelics and human subjects. At the University Hospital of Psychiatry in Zurich, Franz Wollenweider and his team are mapping brain activity during altered states. 64 electrodes attached to this subject's scalp will record a thousand images of brain activity per second. We can make brain maps. It's like road maps. We can show the brain process in terms of chemistry, in terms of functions, in terms of a network, how brain areas interact together, how they are connected. These images, combined with PET scans, allow the team to create three-dimensional pictures of a brain on drugs. In the hallucinating mind, psychedelics overstimulate serotonin receptors in the cortex and deep brain structures. 
Users see images that don't really exist, blurring the line between perception and imagination. His brain is producing that inner experienced image of the world. It can be a little story, a little film, a little, you can see persons or objects. Volenweider's team has discovered that the brain map of a hallucinating mind will always look the same. But for the user, that little film inside the tripper's head can take many shapes and forms. From the sublime to the horrifying. Even an experienced tripper like the dealer Alice can have a bad trip. I was at a psychedelic party and there was a couple hundred people there. I ingested way too much LSD, I feel like. I was eating it and then some of my girlfriends were putting it in our drinks. I felt my, my body dying and myself dying. To find that you don't feel attached to your body, you find frightening that you um, have lost track of time, you find frightening. I'm so high on LSD and I have no idea where I am. Your most horrible nightmare occurring while you're awake. Everything is kaleidoscoping upon itself and I start walking into communities where I are probably not safe communities for me to be alone. As the fear accumulates, it becomes um, terrifying. Tears are pouring down my face. It becomes nightmarish. And I think everyone is out to get me. Everyone is watching me, and I'm losing it. If you are not with people you trust, and you look at them, and they look at you, and they seem to be dangerous and truly ignorant, you then can become paranoid, which raises the fear level, and which makes you terrified, and hoping that it will be over, and then it isn't over. It was a terrible experience. I wish that upon no one. It was horrible for me. What does a trip to hell look like inside the mind? Volenweider's lab has mapped it, and it looks like this. The thalamus and frontal limbic structures are working on overdrive. Anxiety is triggered, and your sense of self dissolves. Cases of psychotic breakdowns, flashbacks, and severe disorientation have been documented after short-term or even one-time LSD use. And since recreational users have no control over the dosage or purity of black market acid, taking it is playing chemical Russian roulette. When these compounds are used, by the wrong individual in, um, in unsafe conditions, they have the potential to cause harm. A small minority undergoing a bad trip may not come back. They may not return. They may be launched into a psychotic state. The subjects were aware at all times. Scientists have witnessed these effects from the earliest studies before LSD became illegal. In the 1950s, they realized that LSD, especially given to human subjects in sterile clinical settings, could result in paranoia and delusions. These distortions of reality look similar to those of patients suffering from psychosis. How long have you been here? Been here? 900 years. 900 years? That's a very long time. The medical profession would give LSD in some very rigid, very medical, very kind of frightening uh, mechanical settings, and people would have what were called um, psychotic-like episodes. For decades, scientists used these psychosis-mimicking drugs to temporarily trigger these effects and peer inside the mentally ill mind. Today, David Nichols is using rats to do just that. They're given 160 micrograms of the purest LSD, not just once, but every other day for months.
Their behavior is closely watched and documented. After chronic dosing, the rats begin to avoid social contact and reject their sugar water, suggesting they no longer seek pleasure. They move fast and startle easily. Schizophrenics withdrawal from society. They have this social withdrawal. We, we saw the same thing in the rats. They became much more active. They became much more aggressive. And that's another symptom that occurs in schizophrenics. Does this mean that LSD can cause schizophrenia? Or does it just mimic some of its effects? There are cases of people who have taken LSD or other psychedelics, and it's precipitated a long-lasting psychiatric disorder and schizophrenia. The consensus in the literature seems to be that that doesn't happen in people who are not uh, predisposed to the illness. That is, someone who would have developed schizophrenia or the illness in any case. The behavior of Nichols' highly dosed rats mimics schizophrenia so well that it's helping his search for a cure. Geneticist Charles Nichols is David Nichols' son and collaborator. He's investigating changes within the genes underlying these behaviors. By understanding how LSD produces its effect at the molecular and genetic level, we could potentially understand mechanisms underlying diseases like psychosis that have very similar overlapping behaviors. If we could go back to the earliest onset of schizophrenia and discover what causes it, then I think we could develop drugs that might arrest it. Mental illness and psychedelic drug use both affect the way the world is perceived. A simple magician's trick shows us why. They call it the hollow mask study. It's all about the way our mind plays tricks on what the eyes see. Dr. Torsten Passi, professor of consciousness studies at the Hanover Medical School in Germany, oversees the test. He has three groups. One is schizophrenic. Another on psychedelics and the third, healthy and sober. He then asks the participants to look through a viewfinder at an image of a face mask. Then they view a second image which appears to be exactly the same. Can you tell the difference? The pictures which are looking like normal faces, but they are in fact not. Like all hollow masks, one side is convex, facing towards you. And the inside is concave, or hollow. No matter which side of the mask they see, the healthy and sober group sees it as facing towards them, because that's what their mind expects. However, those with mental illness or on psychedelics can differentiate between the two sides the majority of the time. Why? Scientists estimate that the brain receives 11 million bits of information per second, but the conscious mind can only process about 200 bits at a time. To handle that amount of input, the brain connects new information to preconceived concepts. For example, if something is flying beside you in a very high speed, you may think that may be dangerous, you know, but if you can identify with your concept this little tiny bit of perceptual info, you know, into, oh, that was a bird, then it's, there's no danger and you calm down again, it's no problem. By temporarily suspending the brain's ability to connect data with these concepts, psychedelics may decondition the mind. It's as if the filters 
that we normally have in order to function are lowered so that literally more can be taken in, more sensory impression, more emotional impression, more visual impression, and more access to parts of the mind. For some, this might be overwhelming or frightening. But for others, it's their way of life. Psychedelics have made me a better person without any doubt at all. It's made me calmer, it's made me more patient, cool. it's made me more imaginative. Like, psychedelics are probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. My hands are moving in perfect unison with the paw. He Ferry and Burning Dan practice a hybrid of dance, juggling, and meditation called flow. Today, each of them has put several drops of LSD on their tongues. It'll take about 40 minutes to kick in. Shh. Feels so like Matrix Ninja Jedi. Kung Fu, like... I'd say we've probably tripped together, what, actually 30 times? That sounds about right. Yeah. I personally have taken psychedelics, if you count all psychedelics, a couple hundred times. They credit psychedelics with improving their flow skills. One thing about psychedelics is that they slow time down or maybe it's just that it speeds your brain up but you have this experience that's like kind of like the bullet time experience where it seems like you have all the time in the world to just reach out and like got it I use LSD as a tool it allows me to do things that I couldn't normally do I can feel patterns I can do tricks. Novel concepts occur to me as obvious and easy, and they are obvious. All great ideas are obvious. Not all obvious ideas are great. T. Ferry and Burning Dan, along with thousands of others, put these tools to use at an event in the desert called Burning Man. Uh, if you want to see where psychedelics are being used today, the most visible place is Burning Man, where 50,000 people get together. And there's an enormous amount of cheerful, open drug taking. So much of Burning Man is about creativity. It's about thinking outside the box. It is about coming up with novel approaches beginner's mind. And I find that psychedelics helps me with exactly that. There may be another reason why users like T. Ferry and Burning Dan feel that they're seeing the world for the first time. It stems from a group of cells in the brain called the locus ceruleus. Nichols calls it the novelty detector. Normally, what happens is if we see something in the environment that's novel, it starts burst firing very quickly. The cells fire very quickly. So if we're sitting in a quiet room like this and someone drops a glass bottle across the room, we all immediately hear it because the locusts really start firing and drew our attention to it. Well, psychedelics amplify the burst firing in novelty. Can this novelty effect of psychedelics be used to help those in desperate situations clean the slate and see life anew? Does it sound okay? Yep. Okay, great. So just lie down, and just relax, and just go into the experience. Annie Levy knows she's going to die in less than a year. 
She has stage four ovarian cancer. All I could think of was, I'm gonna die really soon and it's gonna be horrible, excruciating death. I'm gonna be in horrible pain. I just had these thoughts going over and over again and they wouldn't stop. Annie is scared about dying. She also worries about those she loves. Well, I have a granddaughter who, whose name is Oleana. We call her Oli. I feel like I'm an important part of her life. And she's certainly an important part of my life. And I really feel badly about, and about dying on her. I mean, that's a hard thing. It broke my heart to think of how it was going to break hers. Annie is one of 12 patients with advanced cancer enrolled in this end-of-life study at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Okay, here we have the medicine. Okay. okay. Using a moderate dose of psilocybin, psychiatrist Charles Grobe and his colleague Alicia Danforth shepherd each patient through a psychedelic experience they hope will calm their fear and anxiety. When individuals develop a terminal illness, they're often overwhelmed with anxiety. They often have to take uh, large quantities of pain-suppressing medication, constricts their capacity to appreciate life, and it constricts their sense of who they are, their sense of who they always thought they were, and their sense of purpose, their sense of meaning. This is not about taking psilocybin or other compounds multiple times. It's about orchestrating, if you can, uh, a single profound transformative experience that uh, then results in an unfolding of behavioral change over time. And this here is Tukunima Galtzin, who I met in Tibet. It takes less than an hour for the world to begin to look different to Annie. The drug started to work. It felt like the bed wasn't a bed anymore. It was a circle of hands, and they were all holding me up and supporting me. Do you need anything? Um, OK. OK, just to know you're here. And I felt like I had always been supported that way, and I always would be supported that way. It was my faith coming back to me, my faith, the faith that there's something out there. Franz Vollenweider's lab in Zurich is investigating this spiritual reaction that is so common with psychedelic use. These drugs activate the frontal area of the brain responsible for sense of self, while the amygdala, critical in the processing of fear and anxiety, should also experience mostly heightened feelings. There's no thinking about the person. There's no observer. You just are. It's, it's like trying to describe colors to a blind person. It, it changes the way you think. Of the 12 participants in this psilocybin study, only two survive. Annie passed away during the making. They'd said what they'd needed to say. They'd forgiven people. They'd mended relationships. They can experience a, a sense of close proximity to, to God, to the divine, and they, they report that they are infused with light. The man who created this molecule, Albert Hoffman, warned, if used improperly, LSD could hurt you, disturb you, make you crazy. But Hoffman also said that LSD is a tool to turn us into what we're supposed to be. There's this class of compounds, the psychedelics, uh, that has remained untouched. They're, you know, we're pulling them out of the deep freeze. For 30 years, 40 years, we have not looked at them clinically. And it's just incredibly exciting and compelling to do so. We're on the threshold of learning so much more as well. These compounds are extraordinary probes, and if we are allowed to explore them to the, uh, under approved safe conditions, 
I believe the potential is astounding. The only difference between a drug and a poison is the dose. There, you can't tell me that of all the drugs out there, I mean, even heroin is used to treat pain in other countries. You can't tell me that psychedelics don't have a medical use. They do. We just have to discover it. How psychedelics evolve from this point as agents of healing or misuse is yet to be seen.